Welcome back folks. I've got a 308 video planned for today and this is one I'm pretty excited about because Sierra has released a new hunting bullet called the Sierra Game Changer. The 308 diameter option is 165 grains and as far as I know these are the first like big game hunting bullets that are tipped that Sierra has put out. I think they've got some varmint bullets that are tipped, but their Game King line of bullets are generally soft points or hollow points. So I'm excited to see how these guys shoot. Now in the 165 grain weight, Sierra's got the Spitzer soft point that I've got some videos on for 308. They've also got a hollow point boat tail that unfortunately I don't have any on hand to show you lined up against the, the new game changer. But what you can see in the picture here is this 165 grain game changer is nowhere close to the profile of the 165 grain Spitzer Game King, right? Those are incredibly different bullet designs. And reading the write-up over on their website, they say that Sierra re-engineered their legendary Match King bullet into a hollow point design for quick expansion and fitted it with a transparent green tip for ballistic uniformity. Inside, the Game Changer features a unique construction that utilizes a special lead alloy surrounded by a tough cop copper jacket that delivers excellent penetration and expansion at a variety of ranges. And someone down in the comments of that blog post asked the questions, are they bonded or just game kings with a polymer tip? And the answer was they are not bonded, but they are not standard game kings either. They incorporate much heavier jackets and tougher cores. So the reason I'm reading all this crap, I guess the point I'm trying to get to get to here is I think this 165 grain game changer is going to be closer to the 168 grain match king than it is to its game king brothers either the spitzer which we've already seen is a radically different bullet or the hollow point bow tail which I don't really have on hand to compare so the plan for today's video is to load up some of these guys and I want to shoot them in both my Tika bolt action rifle and also my Aero Precision AR-10. We haven't seen the, the Tika on the channel here in quite some time, but I figured a new hunting bullet from Sierra is a good reason to bring it out of mothballs and get it back here on the channel. So we're going to shoot some groups and then I also want to shoot some of these guys into some ballistic gel to get you know some idea of how these guys are going to expand. So the powder for today has been a tough choice. I've gone back and forth. I've thought about 10 different powders for this video, but I want to go with AR Comp. My final decision came down to AR Comp and Varget. I think both would be great choices for this application. There are lots of great powders for this application. But I decided on AR Comp because this is the beginnings of a load that I might actually hunt with. Sometimes the tests I do here on my channel are just for the fun of it. I don't really have a, an application in mind or a purpose that I'm going to use it for, but this is a load that I might use. I've got a bunch of AR Comp. Back a few years ago when powder was extremely hard to find, I really stockpiled this stuff. So I'm thinking that if I find a good load, at least for the next few years, I've got plenty of powder on hand. I won't have to worry about switching lot numbers and that sort of stuff. So that was one good reason. Another, this is an uh, extremely temperature insensitive powder. It's temperature stable from everything I've read. So I thought it would be a decent choice. This isn't really a super high velocity option. The numbers are respectable, probably pretty close to Varget, but if you really need maximum energy or a little bit flatter shooting load, a slower powder might be a good, uh, a good choice. On Sierra's load data for their 165 grain bullets, Vitavori N550 gave them the, the best velocities. That might be a good choice. And they had several spherical powders with good velocity like uh, Winchester 760 or H414, H380. Those might help you squeak out a little bit more velocity. Okay, so load data, brand new bullet. It's not listed on any of Sierra's sheets yet, but I'm sure this bullet will either drop into the 165 group or maybe the 168 group. Because if this is based on the 168 grain Match King and it has the same bearing surface as the, as the 168 Match King, that might be the, the safer way to think about it as you're out trying to get your, uh, trying to figure out your load data, right? Slightly heavier bullets, your charge weights are generally, generally going to be just a touch lower. So if you're nervous about loading for a bullet with no official load data, then picking numbers for the 168 Sierras might be a better choice. Now, Sierra doesn't have AR Comp listed anyway. So my main source of load data for this was the Alliant website. They've got the 175 grain Match King, the 168 grain Match King, and the 155 grain Match King, along with a whole bunch of other bullets. So the way I went about it was I put all of their max charges onto a little chart here for 155 up to 180 grain bullets, 
just to kind of get an idea of about where I should be. The red dot is what I've chosen for my max charge. We're a little bit below the trend line, so I'm hoping we won't run into any pressure signs today and should be keeping things pretty safe, but still at the same time getting up there pretty close. So 42.0 grains is gonna be our max charge for this test. The primers we're using are the CCI number 200 large rifle primers. And for brass, I'm gonna be breaking in a new set of brass here. One of my supporters over at Patreon, Eric, bought a big huge batch of a thousand pieces of this IMI match brass and was kind enough to send me a hundred of them. IMI is an Israeli military weapons company and I've always heard very good things about their about the IMI brass, kind of like Lake City. So I'm looking forward to giving this stuff a try. I've tried a little bit of IMI brass here and there, but I've never really had kind of a pristine set to use like this. Uh, Eric, who sent it to me, said it holds up better in his gas gun than anything else he's tried. So that's good news because so far my AR-10 has been a little bit tough on brass. So hopefully this stuff will be resilient. Now in 308, when you're talking about military brass, you've always got to keep case capacity in mind because the differences between, you know, something like Lake City and commercial cases, Federal, Winchester, whoever, the difference can be big and it can affect your charges a lot and get you into trouble as far as like seeing pressure signs early and that sort of stuff. The good news is that the Alliant data that we're using as our baseline, several of their loads use IMI brass. So I'm hoping our 42 grain max charge will still be good even if this brass is on the lower end of case capacity. Once we get these things fired, probably in our next video, we'll, we'll go ahead and measure the case capacity and compare it to some others. But that's the brass we're using for today. So if we condense all this rambling I've been doing into some load data, here's what we're shooting. The overall length I'm going with is 2.820. As I mentioned, I'm evaluating this as a potential hunting load. So I wanna be able to magazine feed these guys. These are the Tika magazines. They are not very generous when it comes to overall length. Like 2.825 is about all you can squeeze in here. On the AR-10 side of things, I'm using Magpul P-Mags. They're the same way, just a little bit over 2.8 and things start getting a little bit tight. So I was checking it earlier, 2.820 can squeeze into both. So that's what I've decided to go with. I hope these bullets are pretty tolerant when it comes to jump because they're jumping a bunch in both of the guns. A 2.820 inch overall length results in 185 thousandths of jump to the lands in my JP AR-10 308 barrel. And in the Tika, it's 200 thousandths of jump. That actually ends up, it ends up being 2.1 inches cartridge base to ogive when I uh, use my Hornady bullet comparator. So 2.1 inches cartridge base to ogive, 2.820 ish on the overall length measured to the tip. I was a little bit surprised. The length of these bullets varies a pretty decent amount. Like I, I just measured six or eight of them and got numbers from 1.402 inches up to 1.408 inches. If I measured more, that might grow a little bit. I don't know, but it looks like there's gonna be six or eight thousandths of difference and that's going to directly affect that overall length when I'm measuring to the tip. The good news though is I measured a bunch of them from bullet base to ogive and they all measure 0 0.68, So bullet base to ogive, very consistent, but the tips, not so much. The reason I found that a little bit surprising is like the Hornady bullets, even their older SSTs or the newer ELDX bullets, I've found to be extremely consistent. I don't really think that's a critical thing. Like I, I this doesn't make me think these are gonna be inaccurate bullets. We, we always shoot hollow point match bullets with weird me plats that, that measure a whole bunch of difference. So it's not something I'm freaked out about. It's just something I wanted to bring up. So step one of this process is gonna to be to go ahead and run this brass through a full length sizing die. So let's do that. Now, one thing I did notice was at least a couple of the flash holes had a little bit of a booger I tried to get a picture of one. Hopefully I'm showing it to you on the screen now. So each one of these pieces here, before I run them through the sizing die, I'm gonna take my Lyman flash hole deburring tool, just a, just a twist or two, and that's, an, that's enough. Not really taking off any material, just hitting any burrs that might be present. Some people yell at me, like the way this tool is supposed to be used is you adjust this stop so that you know it's up at the case mouth and you do them all to the same depth and stuff, but I just go in with a very light touch, and if I don't feel 
any burrs there, I call it good enough. One thing I'm noticing is that apparently this IMI brass has got small flash holes. The tip of this tool is just barely, just barely fitting through the flash hole. Tell you what, this is one that definitely has a little bit of a booger. Let me see what it feels like. Yeah, it was very light and very small. Like it, that came right out. I'm like, I bet that would have come out on its own the next time I tumbled this brass with, uh, with some steel pins. But yeah, black, back to the flash hole size. This tool is barely fitting through there. It is fitting through there, but it's just barely fitting through there. And I don't think I've ever seen that on any other brand of brass. Let me grab something else and we'll compare the flash holes here. I'll tell you what, decap this piece of Lapua. Yeah, so I've got a piece of Lapua, a piece of Federal, and this IMI, and it definitely has got a slightly smaller flash hole. I'll try and get a picture and uh, show you here. It's not by much. I'm hoping that like the, uh, the decapping pins in the, yeah, see the decapping pin fits right through there, no problem. So I don't think it's gonna be an issue. It's just a little bit smaller than I've seen in other brass. All right, let's get the, let's get the resizing die in here. Now with brand new brass like this, all I wanna do is just make sure the necks are sized the way I want. So if they got dinged up in shipping or maybe they're not consistent, just trying to make them a little bit uniform. So I've sc screwed my sizing die down until it touches the shell holder. I'm gonna back it out a little bit because I definitely don't wanna bump the shoulder any. I did take a piece of this brass and put it in each of my guns and it goes right in the chamber no problem. So we don't, we don't need to do any sizing to the body or bump the shoulder. And usually in situations like this, the, the body of the case isn't really gonna to touch the, the die very much anyway. So what that means is I can use a dry neck lube. Like this is Redding Imperial dry neck lube. Put that guy down in there a little bit. And that should be all the lube we need. Now, first piece here, I want to get a headspace measurement so I can make sure we're not bumping the shoulder, 1.620. Let's go ahead and run it through. That did go in a little tough. You can actually see with the dry neck lube that the die, the neck portion of the die didn't quite make it down all the way to that neck, uh, that neck shoulder junction or whatever. Yep, same headspace number. So we definitely didn't hit the shoulder, but I wanna go down just a little bit more because I wanna hit that whole neck if it's possible. This guy is going up in there pretty tough but I think it's okay. So we're a little bit, we're getting a little bit lower on that neck now, which is good. And I guess if we wipe that away, we could actually see it properly. See the die just didn't quite make it all the way. Go down a little bit more. Okay, let's try that. Shoulder's still not getting touched and still didn't quite get down as low as I'd like. All right, this should do it. We're pretty close. And I'm switching to a different piece of brass every time I'm making an adjustment. You don't want to take one piece of brass and resize it 14 times while you're screwing around with your die because every time that neck is getting is getting worked. So, yep, we're still not perfect, but I think this is good enough. Pretty darn close. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking that one. Now the advantage of the dry neck lube is that it'll it just wipes right off pretty easy. And paranoid people like myself who are always worried about contaminating their powder with a greasy wet lube or whatever, don't have to worry about it. So dry stuff's no big deal. Wipe a little bit off, tap out a little bit that might be inside and you're ready to load. Now, just because I'm paranoid and I know my Tika has the tighter of the two chambers, just gonna double check and make sure that this brass seems to be chambering okay. And it is. Yep, fitting no problem in the Tika. So that's it. I just need to go through and flash hole deburr, then resize the other 45, and we'll be ready for priming. So when I try to get that picture of the flash holes being smaller in this brass, it's not coming across on camera, man. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills, but I promise. Flash holes in this stuff are a little bit smaller. 
But I grabbed, so the biggest, uh, meatiest, yeah, the meatiest decapping pin I know of is the Lee. This is uh, a spare decapping pin for the Lee Universal, and it goes over no problem. And it goes through there, absolutely no, if I can find it. it oh, oh, there it is, yep, see, no problem. No problem whatsoever. So, the flash holes won't be an issue. There are some cases, like in uh, 6.5 Creedmoor, Lapua makes a small primer brass in that cartridge where the flash holes are so small that some decapping pins won't fit. I don't know if that's a problem with any 308 brass, but at least none that I've used. So I'm just putting a little chamfer on the case mouth here with my Lyman uh, chamfer tool. And the next step will be priming. So I did check the length of this brass and it is perfect. It's right between trim length and max length. Most of them right at 2.008 to 2.010 and our max length is 2.015. So this is just about how I, how I like it because after a firing or two, it's gonna be long enough so that we get to trim it and get them all exactly where we want. The last new batch of 308 I used was Starline and those came very short and it was annoying. Like I, I wanted them a little bit longer so I could trim them all just the way I wanted and it took a bunch of firings to get them to that point. So it shouldn't be a problem here with the IMI. All right, next step will be primers. So I'm installing the primers with my RCBS hand priming tool. Not much to show you here. Pretty straightforward stuff. Other than to say that these, uh, the IMI brass, the primer pockets feel great. They seat in there nice and tight. And every single piece has felt very consistent so far. So it's all good, man. It's time to weigh some powder. So I'm making progress here, getting our charges weighed out. I decided to just use my RCBS Uniflow powder measure. Throwing the charges just a little bit light and then trickling them right up. A lot of times with an extruded powder, I'll use the, the Lyman Gen 6 powder dispenser. But AR Comp is a very shortcut extruded powder. Here's a pan full of it next to some Varget. Varget is on the right and AR Comp is on the left. You can see it's a little bit, it's a little bit smaller cut than Varget, but Varget's not really a particularly long cut powder either. But in this case, powder measure works just as quick as the Lyman Gen 6. I'm pleasantly surprised by our case fill here. I thought 42 grains of this stuff might not really fill the case very well and we'd have a whole bunch of excess case capacity, but it doesn't look like that's gonna be the case. This 42 grain charge, our max charge, is coming right up to the bottom of the neck and with our 2.820 overall length, it's gonna be just about perfect. All right, let's get our bullet seating die dialed in here and we can hurry up and get to the range. I am using Hornady custom grade dies. These are their inexpensive die sets that I've been having a lot of good luck with lately in 6.5 Creedmoor and 224 Valkyrie. And this is actually my first time using this set in 308. So I've got a piece of brass in the shell holder. We raise the ram and then you screw the die down until you feel it touch. These do include a crimp. So that's what you feel is the, the crimp hitting the case mouth. And then we back it out by a full turn and tighten down the lock ring. We're not gonna be doing any crimping today. So this will be the, the setting where it stays. So let me back out the seating stem. I am using the their micro just seating stem, which is about an additional 25 bucks and turns it into a micro adjust die and makes it really easy to use. So what I did is I just bought one of them and then I switch them between the different dies. So let's see, that barely touched it. Let's go ahead and seat it down in there a little bit more. Okay, that got us started. So my goal is 2.1 inches with the Hornady bullet comparator. So got this guy started. 
and it looks like we are exactly 250 thousandths too long right now. So let's try and go 240 thousandths. That'll still leave us 10 thousandths long. 50, 100, 150, 200, 40. So let's see how accurate the micro just stem is on an adjustment that long. Yep, 2.119. So we're 19 thousandths long rather than 2.110. So nine thousandths on an adjustment that big, I can live with that. So let's go ahead and seat another one and make sure our numbers are lining up. I am hearing just a little bit of crunch as I'm seating. So they, these are just a little bit compressed, which can be good for accuracy, right? A nice full case is a good thing, but they're not super crunchy. 2.118, 2.117, that's the same number we had before, right? So let's go ahead and go down 17. There's 10, 15. Okay, it's still two thousandths long. Now the nine thousandths of error we saw on the big adjustment was probably due to the charge getting compressed. Once you start compressing loads, it can start messing with your numbers just a touch. Okay, looks like we're just right on the money with that guy. Here's the other one. It is also perfect. Go ahead and seat the other three in this first row. Okay, these are coming out just about perfect. There's a 2.1005, so it's just a half a thousandths long. 2.101, and yeah, this one's also, uh, it's kind of bouncing back and forth between 2.1005 and 2.101. Perfect. Now, if we measure out to the tip, there's a 2.823, 2.818, 2.826. You can see quite a bit of variation here with these bullets, but we've already looked at the cartridge-based ogive number, and they're all extremely close, so all of this variation is coming from the tips. Now it's got me a little bit worried, like that guy's 2.829. Will that fit in my magazine? That's what we need to check. Start with the Tika magazine. Yep, it looks like it will. I'll tell you what, I'll just go ahead and throw all five of them in here. Yep, totally good to go with the Tika. They went in no problem. Now the P mag. Yeah, I think we're good. Definitely wouldn't want to go any longer, but I think we're okay there. So that really covers it, folks. I've got some more charges to weigh out and some more bullets to seat. If anything exciting comes up, I'll turn the camera back on, but otherwise I'll just see you guys out on the range. All right, folks, we are starting out with my Tika T3 Lite bolt action rifle. It's been so long since I've shot it that I don't even remember its specs. So I'll put them up here on the screen for you. As the T3 light name suggests, this is a very light rifle and it kicks like a mule, even in little old 308. So I'm shooting off a cheap little generic bipod and this guy's a handful, so you're gonna see it bouncing all over the place during recoil. So if you wanna leave comments about how I'm flinching, you can do so down in the comments section below. We're shooting at 100 yards. I've got my Caldwell Ballistic Precision Chronograph out there. I'm hoping it's gonna give us some good readings. It is pretty close to dark, I'm shooting after work and it's the middle of September. The days are getting shorter, so we're a little bit short on time. But I think I've got enough time to make sure the barrel stays cool. Speaking of that, I did shoot a couple ciders. I shot three ciders through the gun just to warm up the barrel a little bit. Double check my zero. This is a 24 power Viper Vortex PST scope. We're shooting at 100 yards. So let's see if these guys will group. All right, so I'm pretty darn happy with that group to start out with. So I loaded up a fair number of ciders because I was mounting this scope on here and needed to zero this guy and same thing with the AR-10. So I've already shot a few of these all the way up to 42 grains and didn't see any pressure problems. So I don't expect any problems. All right, moving up to 41.1 grains.
Okay, so according to my Caldwell chronograph, we just lost like 20 feet per second. I don't trust it. I'll tell you what I'll do. Later on, I'm gonna load up some more of these, shoot them off camera with my magneto speed chronograph, and those are the velocity numbers I'll give you there. This Caldwell chronograph, it, it gives me weird readings right at dark, and that really sucks because it screws up my videos when I need to shoot them after work. I'll tell you, it's been a while since I've shot the Tika. I really miss this trigger, man. These Tikas have awesome triggers. This is an amazing deer hunting rifle, and I'd recommend one to anybody, but I've got too many amazing deer rifles right now. So I'm thinking I really should rebarrel this guy, put a nice heavy barrel on it that's threaded so I can shoot with my suppressor and get it into a nice stock that'll be easier to shoot off of bags. But I don't think I would change a darn thing about the trigger. Adding a trigger to this setup just seems like it would be a big old waste. All right, next up, 41.4 grains. All right, so that group opened up a good bit. So it's taken me over 30 minutes to shoot these first 15 shots, but even still, the barrel's getting a little bit warm. So I'm trying to be careful about barrel heat here. Okay, a little bit of time to cool down. So let's get back to it. Helps to put the magazine in. There, now let's get to it. Man, this stupid barrel heats up so fast. I gotta rebarrel this stupid gun, but it seems to be wanting to throw them a little bit high. Maybe our last charge here, 42.0 grains, things will settle down, maybe it'll group a little bit high. I don't know. Let's shoot them and find out. All right, that's a good way to finish things off, right? Definitely our best group and our highest charge at that. Outstanding stuff, good good stuff. This is looking like a good shooting bullet so far to me. All right, let's switch over to the AR-10. I hope we've got enough daylight left. All right, so we're just gonna brighten up the camera and pretend that we've got enough daylight left. Hopefully the target camera is still showing you what you need to see. The good news though is that we can shoot a little bit faster here with our JP AR-10 barrel. It's a nice heavy barrel. It's pretty resilient when it comes to barrel heat so far in my testing. The biggest problem so far is that it is a brass destroyer. I've had a lot of problems so far getting the gas settings just right so that it won't destroy brass. All right, let's see if it'll shoot. Now, one thing I should mention, I haven't warmed this gun up at all and I don't really even have time to do so. So totally cold barrel. Tell you what, I'm pretty happy with that for a completely cold barrel. Not too bad. All right, moving on, 41.1.
So that group was pretty ugly and it didn't lock the bolt back. I've been screwing around with the gas before we started shooting groups here, trying to get this thing to stop tearing up brass. So I don't know why that one didn't lock the bolt back, but the first group did, but I've got the gas set to where it just barely locks it back. So not a huge surprise, but what was a surprise was that super crappy group. Like that was ugly. Yeah, our barrel's barely getting warm at this point. So can't really blame it on barrel heat. I don't know, that's weird. So moving right along, 41.4 grains is next. Okay, next up, 41.7. All right, don't screw it up. Don't screw it up. <laughs> Holy crap. That felt like a good shot. <laughs> Man, that is insane. Four of them right there together and then one like an inch out. Okay, last up is 42 grains. I'll tell you one thing. This 24 power Vortex Strike Eagle scope is really doing well here, right at dark. Like it is extremely dark, but I'm seeing my dots really, really well. Okay, 42 grains. All right, finished off with a pretty crappy group. Hey, at least I got them all shot before dark. So tomorrow evening, we're going to shoot through ballistic gel and I need to load up some more rounds because now I need to get velocity data with my magneto speed tomorrow evening as well. So normally I would say, let's get back to the bench, but let's get back to tomorrow evening and look at some ballistic gel. All right, so my gel testing was a bit of a fiasco. I did shoot these at short range. Some of my previous gel tests, I actually put the gel down range, but this was, I was about 10 yards from the blocks. I shot them with my Tika, which means our velocity was about 2,735 feet per second with these guys. Two of the shots exited the block just because I wasn't aligned very well, but the, I was able to recover three of them. And they look beautiful. Really nice expansion. And looks to be very nice weight retention. None of the cores separated from the jacket at all. They just mushroomed out beautifully. So I am extremely happy with the expansion of these guys. This is exactly what I was hoping to see. Let me weigh them really quick. This one is 136 grains. That one's 129 grains. And that guy is 135 grains. So they shed about 30 grains. That is really good stuff. Now I was using uh, the synthetic gel from Clear Ballistics. The penetration numbers I showed you between 25 and 31 inches. I don't know if that's good or bad. I just, most of the high velocity rifle rounds that I shoot seem to penetrate a, a, a similar depth into that gel. They generally go halfway to three quarters of the way through that second block. At least, uh, you know, bullets that hold together like this generally go about that far. So it's all good, man. I'm gonna feel extremely confident hitting the woods with these. Should get the job done. Okay, next let's have a look at some brass. 
These are the 42 grain maximum charge, and these were fired in the Tika. So these look outstanding. Nice round primers, definitely no pressure science to speak of. They look excellent. So I would feel okay maybe going a little bit hotter, but we are, we're already a little bit compressed, but there's definitely room for a little bit more powder in there. Now here's the problem child over here in the AR-10. These are actually a couple of the lower loads. And that one looks mostly okay, but this guy right here, you'll see a raised up burr and a little bit of a smear at the extractor. A lot of the brass did this. And this is just, you know, my AR-10 doing its thing. There you go, there's a couple more that got banged up a touch. So the next video with the AR-10, we're gonna be using my uh, JP Silent Captured Spring. I, I ordered the parts to convert it for AR-10 use. So by the time I make the next video with the AR-10, I'll have those parts and we'll be able to try a heavier buffer. Maybe that will help with the brass damage because I've been all over the map with gas settings and it just isn't helping at all. Okay, now let's have a look at the groups. I'm pretty happy with the performance out of the Tika. These are what good 308 groups look like on my channel. I have always struggled with 308. I've always struggled with this Tika, and now I'm struggling with my AR-10. 308 is just my Achilles heel, and we just cannot seem to get the precision out of 308 that we get out of other cartridges here on my channel. So while these groups may not be incredibly good, they're pretty good for around here. The best group was the last one, 42 grains. That was a 0.895 inch group. I definitely want to shoot this load again and verify it and go a little bit higher, maybe get a little bit more velocity. 2750 feet per second should certainly be attainable with this combination, you know, with this powder. But overall, I'm pretty pleased here with the Tika. I'll tell you what we need to do with the Tika is when I do the video on this dude, the Limb Saver Barrel Deresonator, this might be the perfect gun to play around with this guy on. It's never really shot as good as I'd like and we might see some huge benefits from a little bit of tuning. I bet we would. So moving on to the AR-10 groups, things were a bit of a mess. I mean, we started out okay. That first group was a 1.092 inch group. And that fourth group, you know, it tried to put four shots through the same hole and then threw that one way down low. We're just struggling with this gun so far. It's still a new barrel, a new upper that we put together and our accuracy has been disappointing. Tearing up brass has been very disappointing. So this is just more of the same for this gun. So I'm not gonna dwell too much here on the groups out of this gun. Velocity was a little bit lower, about 2700. What did I, 2705 is what I called it. I didn't shoot enough rounds over the magneto speed to give you any data on standard deviation and stuff and extreme spread. I only shot enough to get just basically give you an idea of what sort of velocities we were looking at. Cause well, I just didn't have enough bullets to, to waste them shooting over the chronograph. So two and a half inch shorter barrel and about 30 feet per second difference. That didn't seem too bad. Now, one really good thing is we're not done with the game changers. I also picked up two boxes of the 6.5 millimeter. These are 130 grainers. So I wanna shoot some of these in 6.5 Creedmoor and in the 6.5 Grendel. So if you're disappointed by the accuracy in this video, and you don't believe me that, yeah, these are these are actually pretty decent 308 groups for my guns. Well, come back for the 6.5 millimeter videos and I, I think the groups are probably gonna be a good bit tighter, or at least that's what I'm hoping. Now, on top of this 30 caliber and 6.5 millimeter that we've seen here, they've also got a six millimeter that is 90 grains, a 277 that is 140 grains, a 284, a seven millimeter that is 165 grains, and I think that's about it. I'll tell you what I'm hoping they'll do is if they if they would make a 22 caliber, start off with the 95 grain Match King, chop the tip off of that guy and turn it into a game changer. That would make for a pretty cool hunting bullet for the 224 Valkyrie. We'll just have to see what else they come up with as time goes on. So that's about it, folks. Pretty good first impression here with the game changer. I absolutely love the way these bullets expanded in the gel. I'll be gel testing the 6.5 millimeter as well once I get to those videos. And over in that caliber, we'll be able to do high velocity tests with the, with the 6.5 Creedmoor and then maybe see how it does at low velocity out of the Grendel as well. Because that was another question that I saw answered over on the Sierra Bullets blog. When they announced this bullet, someone asked what the minimum expansion velocity is and they said it was 1800 feet per second. So these guys are tough. You gotta push them to get them to expand properly. So maybe if you're a 300 blackout shooter or something like that, yeah, this, this bullet's not for you. And I suspect it may be the same story out of the Grendel or maybe with the Grendel, we won't get, you know, 
nearly as much expansion. I don't know. We'll see. I'm looking forward to finding out. And those videos should be coming pretty soon here over the next couple weeks. Speaking of videos, man, it has been a huge challenge to get videos put out over the last couple weeks just because of rain. Like last weekend, it rained Saturday and Sunday and lots of evenings it's been raining. So I apologize for the pretty big gap between my last video and this video, but I'm blaming the weather. So that's it, folks. Thanks for joining me today and I'll see you next time.